Welcome to this webinar discussing the role operations research and analytics can play in addressing the issues of voting rights and election integrity. These issues are swirling around Washington, D.C. and many other states right now. Hi, I'm Ashley Smith, the Public Relations Specialist at INFORMS. INFORMS is the leading international association for operations research and analytics professionals. This is just one of a series of webinars we're conducting to showcase how operations research and analytics can save lives, save money, and solve problems for policymakers and society. Today, I'm joined by two very distinguished guests, Dr. Natalie Scala and Dr. Josh Dellinger, to discuss the role of mail-in voting through the lens of operations research and analytics. Dr. Scala and Dr. Dellinger will also discuss the key role poll workers play in election infrastructure security. Dr. Scala is an associate professor and the director of graduate programs in supply chain management in the College of Business and Economics at Towson University. Dr. Josh Dellinger, also of Towson University, is a professor and the director of the undergraduate program in computer science in the Department of Computer and Information Sciences. Dr. Scala and Dr. Dellinger will each give a short presentation, followed by moderated questions. Dr. Scala, let's start with you. All right, thanks, Ashley. Um, I am Dr. Natalie Scala. I'm at Towson University, and we want to talk to you a little bit today about the research that Josh and I are doing in both voter access and elections infrastructure security. And when we think about voter access, we frame it in the terms of mail-based voting. So I think most of us on this who are watching this webinar, or maybe all of us, will know why we are here. But as a quick kind of a quick recap, the Help America Vote Act of 2002 brought sweeping reforms to voting processes, and this came out of the 2000 general election and the subsequent Bush versus Gore litigation. This also brought the beginning of electronic voting systems to the U.S. and also increased voter access as well. Fast forward to 2019, when the Senate, the Senate Intelligence Committee revealed that the election systems in all 50 states were targeted in 2016. Special Counsel Mueller testified in 2019 to Congress that interference was ongoing um, by foreign adversaries in 2019 and expected to continue through the 2020 election cycle. Also in 2017, after the 2016 general election, the Department of Homeland Security for the first time classified elections infrastructure as US critical infrastructure. And it's important to remember that that is just voting systems, the storage of ballots and equipment and associated infrastructure. This is not um, political campaigns or political action groups. This is just the actual elections equipment and the mechanics of the election itself. But as we all know, the voter access and elections infrastructure security remain of interest after the 2020 election. So as policymakers, we are familiar with terms like tampering and meddling and, and, and um, interference, but the typical American, that might feel a little removed to them. They may not necessarily understand all of that or feel like it applies to them. So in our research, we take a look at that typical American and we want their votes to have integrity meaning from the moment they cast it, whether it's a mail-based ballot or it's in person at a polling place, from the moment it's cast to the moment it's count, that vote remains has integrity, meaning nothing happens to it, there's no issues, it's going to be counted as it's cast. So in our research, we take a look at threats and we define them systemically in terms of cyber, physical, and insider threats. Now, cyber threats you are probably most likely aware of, and we talk about them a lot in election security, that's digital media and digital machines, whether or not they are connected to the internet. Physical threats tend to be tampering or disrupting equipment. So a typical example of this is equipment is typically set up the night before at an election, either at a worship center, polling place, um, school, gymnasium, things like that. The building is locked and then we come back the next day. We obviously don't want anything to happen to that equipment overnight. And then insider threats are two different kinds of ways to look at insider threats. And these are human threats. The first one is just honest mistakes. These are trusted insiders and stakeholders in the process who don't mean to cause a problem, but they make some sort of mistake in the process. And that unfortunately introduces a risk or a vulnerability. Um, insiders can also be nefarious. They could be there with the intent to cause harm or be adversarial in the process as well. 
So we want to take a look at examples of these three types of threat. Here's a draft that kind of identifies various sources of those threats or where those threats may come from. And again, insiders are mostly human-based threats. Physical threats have to do with the actual equipment itself and potential tampering of the equipment. And then cyber threats, again, are digital machines, digital media, and digital type components. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about mail voting and the voter access components to that. Josh will talk more about elections, infrastructure, security, and our work at polling places. But mail voting has been used in the U.S. in some form since the Civil War, um, mostly as an absentee process, but in some states it is way more um, widespread than just an absentee process. We saw a wide scale rollout of mail voting during COVID-19, and this happened literally overnight in some states, especially in the primary season. For example, Ohio canceled its in-person day election day vote the night before the election in the primary season. And they converted to extended absentee vote ballots for a couple more weeks, for a few more weeks. And this was all due to COVID-19 concerns back in March of 2020. But this was literally an overnight scale up of mail voting in many states very quickly. But we did see in 2020 very little to no fraud in many states or voter error issues. Um, mail voting is safe and it is socially distant way of voting. And our research shows, and we're going to talk about this here today, how mail voting can increase voter access while also discouraging adversarial meddling by foreign actors, hackers, or other types of um, interdictions into the process. So how can mail voting be targeted? So what we looked in our research is, you know, what is a way, all, what are all the specific ways that mail voting can go wrong, basically? And we don't necessarily have evidence that all of these ways that mail voting can be targeted were actually compromised at some point. But we need to get an understanding of what can go wrong before we can figure out what to do about it and how to keep the process and the way of voting secure. So we started with some data from the Elections Assistance Commission that was published in 2009. And the Elections Assistance Commission came up with essentially an inventory of risks, a list of everything that could go wrong in mail-based voting. And they only came up with a, an inventory of risk and they did not necessarily assess that inventory for strength or likelihood or how probable something was to happen. They just listed all the potential vulnerabilities with mail-based voting. And the Elections Assistance Commission broke this up into three groups or stakeholders of risk. The first one is insiders. And again, those could be honest mistakes or they could be nefarious and intending to cause harm. Examples of risks associated with insiders are altering marked ballots, discarding someone's ballots, delaying them in the mail, things like that. Um, external threats are another category. Those are what we considerly, traditionally consider adversarial, foreign actor, third party, nation state, someone outside of the process trying to cause an issue inside the voting process. That could be dead voters, um, an attack at a mailbox, buying votes, organized coercion, things like that. And then voter error, just playing the voter makes a mistake. And sometimes we call that fraud, um, but that is also the failure to sign the ballot by the vote voter. The signature doesn't match the card. There's a correction mistake, things like that. But a lot has changed since 2009. First of all, it's been over 10 years. Five states in the United States have either fully or mostly moved to mail-based voting as the way they conduct their elections. And this was before COVID-19. Um, obviously, we had COVID-19 and this overall overnight scale up on mail-based voting across the United States and the adaptive adversary. We cannot assume that our adversaries are going to be in the same technological place with the same goals and the same tax tactics that they had 10 years ago. So they are going to evolve and change and we need to defensively evolve and change as well. So to investigate how to improve or update this list of inventory of threats and look at the last 10 years and make it current, we considered three things in our research, the implications of COVID-19. That's example, for example, drop boxes. We were not using that in mail voting before. Now all of a sudden we had drop boxes in many states. Um, threats to critical infrastructure. The EAC defined their um, threats in 2009. That was before 2017 in DHS classifying elections infrastructure as critical. And again, the adaptive adversary. Um, overall, we've defined 102 threats to mail-based voting, which includes the EAC threats plus new ones, and those are executed in 72 scenarios. 
meaning sometimes multiple things have to happen together in order for the system to be attacked or breached. But there's really 72 ways that the system could be attacked through various threats. So what are these new threats that we defined in our research? And there are multiple, they're all listed right here on this slide. And typically they tend to deal with things like drop boxes, which were new in 2020, voter ID, which has been a question and a concern by many, and this idea about the postal service and this higher role at the postal service and this more um, key role that they were playing in the voting process. But it's not limited to just those things. And we took a look at a full scale of threat and a full understanding of what could potentially happen. And again, we have no evidence that these things happened in 2020 or will happen in the future, but they're things we need to be worried about and things we need to care about. So what we did in our research is we did a mathematical assessment through something called utility theory and decision analysis to get an understanding of not only what are these new threats, but what is the strength or likelihood. And as I mentioned before, the EAC never considered strength or likelihood or probability of a threat before they just provided an inventory. So we took their threats plus these new threats and did an understanding of how likely is something to happen. So when I have relative likelihood on the screen here, it's very clear and it's very important to understand that this is not a probability of something going wrong. This is just a strength calculation where we look at each individual threat against itself, against each other on the list to get an understanding of which ones are the like strongest or the most important or the most concerning within that list. Um, we found in our research, and what we did is we assessed it on three separate categories. We looked at attack cost, which is the adversary or the person who is trying to interdict on the system, the cost for them, either money, time, things like that. The technical difficulty for an adversary or an insider or someone to create a problem in the system, how hard is it for them? And then from an information assurance perspective, we looked at discovering difficulty. How easy would it be for us to find out? If something went wrong in the system, can we find out about it? And what we found by looking at the three categories of threat like the EAC had, is that insider threats were actually a majority of our scenarios. So believe it or not, trusted insiders are responsible or accountable for po potentially most of the vulnerabilities in mail-based voting. If you look at the second graph with external threat, more than half of all the external threats have the lowest relative likelihood of zero to 3%. What we found is that external actors and adversaries are not interested or incentivized in mail-based voting. And when you think about that, that makes a lot of sense. If they wanted to attack mail voting, for example, with impact, you would have to hit multiple drop boxes, tens or hundreds of mailboxes, and if they were able to compromise one mailbox, there wouldn't even be that many votes in it. It wouldn't be even an entire precinct worth of votes. So it's very, very difficult for the adversary to attack mail voting with impact. And then voter error. Voter error is only 13% of our total or almost 14% of our total scenarios. There's not that many ways for the voter themselves to cause error in the system or cause fraud at the voter perspective. Um, there are other ways for mail voting to be compromised, but really voters are not our highest concern here. Those 72 scenarios are actually on this graph here. So there's actually 72 bubbles and they're plotting on top of each other based on the assessment of our three categories of attack cost, technical difficulty and discovering difficulty. But the key here to take away on this slide is that the white bubbles, which are the external threats, the adversarial threats pushed on the left-hand side meaning these are the lowest likelihood, the lowest strength of threats, the lowest like strength of threat. And again, that means the adversary is not incentivized to attack this process. The yellow threats are insider threats. Josh is gonna talk a lot about our work at polling places and with poll workers to help train them to help us mitigate insider threat. We can do very similar things in mail voting and use training and interdictions and a culture of security to help mitigate the threat of insiders. And then black threats on here, the black shaded bubbles are voter error related threats. Voter error, we've been watching for years. We have many counties and states have processes in place to catch potential fraud. Potential issues were caught in 2020. Pennsylvania had three of them, for example. There are mitigations already in place and being used to catch these if they would indeed happen.
we also have a few threats and most concerns. So I mentioned there's 102 threats and that we were looking at and studying in 72 scenarios. Here are the highest relative likelihood. And again, these are not probabilities. These are just strength of threat in comparison to the other ones on the list. This is the list of threats of most concern. The interesting thing is, is that we added new threats based on COVID-19, the adaptive adversary and critical infrastructure. All of those threats we had on the chart, none of them become a threat of most concern, which is really comforting. Because if we scale up mail-based voting overnight in 2020, which we did, we added drop boxes and all sorts of stuff, none of that was the most concerning. Those were not the strongest threats in the process. Those were not what we were supposed to be worried about. So if we continue with these types of access issues and or access ways in the future, they're not going to be the highest threat to potential voter integrity issues or vote integrity issues. So the quick move we had to not necessarily make this process less safe. And these threats that are on this list have been on the radars of states and counties for 10, 15 years. They are already monitoring for this. They already have mitigations in place. We also contribute some mitigations in our research for states and counties. And the key one, like I mentioned a second ago, is to look at insiders and training them and helping them to become trusted parts of this process and mitigating the potential threat that they may have by either being making honest mistakes or potentially being adversarial themselves. So for some of our key takeaways for mail-based voting, mail-based voting is secure. It has integrity, those votes have integrity. It increases voter access by allowing people to vote at home, socially distanced on their own time. And it is not attractive for the adversary. They are not interested in attacking this. So to me, being able to increase voter access and disincentivizing the adversary is somewhat of a double win for democracy, right? We get some of this interference out of the process or not as strong in the process, and we have more people voting or the opportunity to vote. Our research specifically, we are the first to consider the likelihood or strength of threat in our for mail voting. We update the only known inventory of threats for mail voting. That's that EAC data we've been talking about. A majority of the threat scenarios are tied to insider actions, something we need to start looking at more in terms of policy. And we propose some mitigations for the most concerning threats. A greater awareness of, th of threats and the relative strength of them will enable elections officials to apply security measures more effectively and efficiently. And now Josh is gonna talk a little bit about our elections infrastructure security research and our work at polling places. Great, thank you, Natalie. So our work has not only focused on mail-based voting, but has also looked at the potential threats at local polling places, the places we, we all go to to vote in person. For the most part, we are one of the very few academic teams looking at threats at the local level and at local election infrastructure. Much of the existing literature looks at security threats to statewide election infrastructure. And while in-person voting, as of recently, hasn't been a big focus over the last year, because of the increased use of mail-in voting because of the COVID-19 pandemic, in-person voting is still critical. So who are the people out of polling places? Everyday voters interact with their local polling places and their local election poll workers, and it's vital for election integrity and election security that when a voter goes into their local polling place to cast their vote, that they feel that their vote is secure that their vote will be counted and their election process has integrity. Just as if you were to go to a store or a restaurant, and if you were to get the feeling that it's disorganized or unclean, you will not have incompetence in it. The same thing is true at local polling places. And a big part of that confidence and a big part of our election security and integrity are those election poll workers. The nearly 1 million highly seasonal poll workers are the first line of defense in our election security. And they have the first opportunity to be able to identify, mitigate any threats that could develop during the election process. Unfortunately, we have found and other literature has found that oftentimes election poll worker training does not include training specific to the cyber, physical and insider threats that Natalie mentioned about that could in fact arise. In fact, in Maryland, we found that election poll workers are sometimes hired day of the election. So in our work, 
we've leveraged the threat modeling that we've done to identify the cyber, physical, and insider threats, a lot of what Natalie talked about. And along with our Board of Elections partners, we developed a series of seven online training modules specific to help election poll workers be able to uh, have the awareness and be able to identify and mitigate the threats that can arise to specific election processes. So for example, uh, threats at the scanning unit or for administering same day registration or administering provisional voting. The modules that we developed for election poll workers take a see something, say something approach to be able to empower the election poll workers to have the awareness and the understanding to be able to identify, recognize, and then take action when a potential threat arises. These developed modules are independent of each other. There's seven of them. They're modular in a way that they target a specific election process. And they are designed so that a election judge responsible for that particular election process can be trained only to that. These modules were designed to be injected into an existing election judge training process. That is, they provide short 20 minute supplemental content specifically targeting the cyber, physical, and insider threats for that particular process. Those things that are not currently covered in existing training. The training modules content explicitly includes some background and introduction on that particular uh, election process. So for example, on the screen, we're showing the training for the poll books. It provides a review of the equipment use. So how to set up, how to administer during election day, and then how to tear down or uh, decommission that piece of equipment. And then unique to this work, it covers those cyber, insider, and physical threats particular to that process. This training is also to ensure that the poll workers develop the understanding and the awareness of it. So to help enable and encourage that, the modules at each stage include self-assessment questions, right, to provide a review of the content in that module to assess whether the poll worker is developing that understanding and providing them feedback. The idea of these training modules is to provide, again, election poll workers a review of what they've covered prior times in training, and then also provide those specific threat trainings. Hopefully, uh, we are encouraging poll workers to take these about a week before the election for review. These are online, so they can be at home and separate than the normal training process. This modular design was also utilizing best practices for pedagogy. So the content was designed with both segmentation and interactivity involved. So that's try to, trying to decrease the cognitive overload so that election poll workers can actually attain the content. Specifically, segmentation is used in taking this large set of content and breaking it up into smaller pieces so that the election judge can focus just on that one piece at a time. Interactivity is also used in that in the assessment questions when a election poll worker uh, selects the wrong answer or the right answer, feedback is given to them to encourage that they attain the knowledge that we want them to achieve. These developed training modules were deployed on, on the learning platform developed at Towson University, the security injections at Towson platform. This has been a successful nationally used platform that's specific for training undergraduate computing and non-computing students to develop good security practices. And not only did we want to develop training modules and deploy them for use by election poll workers, but we want to ensure that these training modules were effective. So to assess the effectiveness of the developed training modules, we conducted in-person data collection of current and future election poll workers leading up to the 2020 primary election, all of before COVID hit. And we used a pre-post-test approach where a current election poll worker or a future potential poll worker would take a pre-test to understand their awareness of the various threats for a particular election process. So for example, for the electronic poll book, for provisional voting, or for the scanning unit. 
after that pretest, they would go through and interact with our training module so that they could learn and understand and be able to better identify and mitigate potential threats. And then they would take this post test to see if that knowledge was actually attained. And in fact, the training modules do work, right? So that not only are they on getting a review of how to use the equipment, but they're having a better understanding of how to be able to, again, identify and mitigate potential threats on election day. So our research takes this broad approach where we not only look at mail-based voting and in-person voting threats, but also to develop actionable steps through training and potential mitigation strategies to decrease those threats. Our approach is data-driven so that we can better understand the cyber, physical, and insider security threats to our mail-based and in-person voting processes and provides recommendations to help secure the integrity of our election process. Uh, as Natalie mentioned, we have developed a comprehensive risk assessment of mail-based voting, uh, systematically defined the threats that can occur during election process, those cyber, physical, and insider threats, and developed effective training modules for election workers. In an environment where election security is highly politicized, this work provides actionable steps to empower election workers and suggest mitigations for the highest relative likelihood of threats that may emerge during the election process. We have a lot more that we wish we could talk about for those who would like more information. Uh, several of our papers are talking about both the, the, the mail-based voting threats, uh, how we've utilized training and uh, more specifics on our training modules are provided here. Uh, we'd encourage us uh, to interact with you and we would appreciate any questions or uh, concerns that you might have. Thank you. Natalie and Josh, thank you both for that informative presentation. Uh, we'll start the moderated questions portion of the webinar. The first question being, why is data science an important tool in protecting the security of elections? So I'll take that. Data science allows us to take a look with fact-based lens at the risks associated with various forms of voting. And it also gives us a clear, unbiased assessment or inventory of what just those risks could even be. So just to figure out what could go wrong and then how likely something is to go wrong. But to do that in an unbiased way, data is not associated with a party or political kind of affiliation or anything like that. So we're able to make assessments and calculations to draw impartial conclusions. Thank you, Natalie. And to what extent is data science being used in election security? Yeah, so like Natalie mentioned, data science and data analytics are being used in election security, just like many other aspects of our lives, to try to understand complex phenomena in an unbiased, scientific, factual way, right? So to draw conclusions from actual data, not just beliefs and conjecture. So Natalie and I are one of the few academic teams looking at election security from a data analytics point of view, specifically at the local level. And we're doing that so we can come up with clear data-driven solutions and understanding of election security. So for example, like Natalie mentioned in her portion of the talk, we examined the Elections Assistant Commission report from 2009 of the assessment and threat trees, and we updated them and developed a comprehensive risk model to understand the actual threats and the actual severity of the threats for both mail-in voting and in-person voting. So with this unbiased, informed uh, understanding of election security and those threats and possible mitigations, uh, we can provide decision makers and legislators to informed, non-political, non-party funded or affiliated insights to election security of those potential threats and how we can handle them. And from an operations research and analytics perspective, what are the biggest vulnerabilities to election security today? So trusted insiders, such as poll workers and elections officials, play an absolutely critical role in the security of our elections and keeping them both free and fair. But that being said, you know, our research shows that particularly with mail voting, most of the vulnerabilities in terms of quantity, just like a list of those vulnerabilities, are really attributed to insiders. Now, that does not mean, again, that the vulnerabilities have ever been compromised in any sort of way. 
but we need to start framing election security. And there's a lot of ways to look at election security and a lot of ways to frame it. But one of the ways we really need to frame this problem is in terms of our partnerships and roles with trusted insiders. And we can build cultures of security. We can encourage, we can enforce training and we can do other types of mitigations which will also help to combat these vulnerabilities or threats attributed to insider. So you're a leading proponent of mail-in voting. Can you discuss the relationship between mail-in ballots and election security? Mail-based voting increases access, it's safe, and it's also socially distant. So socially distant was obviously very important during COVID-19 pandemic. But as we move forward in what's hopefully a post-pandemic society, these principles still have value. So for example, the socially distant aspect moving forward means people can vote on their own time. Now, again, you have to vote within the voting window and the days you have for mail voting, but you can do it on your own time. We don't have to go to a polling place or a specific time during the day. This is gonna increase access. This is gonna increase, increase opportunities to vote. And our models predicted before the election what we actually saw happen. Very few cases of documented fraud or voter error. Like I mentioned before, Pennsylvania had three and definitely at a very low percentage, three cases when you think of the millions of votes that were cast, particularly by mail. So we've had mitigations for voter error, voter fraud, like things like that in place for years. And the new threats that we've identified in our research based off of, you know, beyond the 2009 data really don't identify any of them as the most, even as the most concerning, right? The newer threats are not the most concerning or the highest strength threats for mail voting. So again, we can train trusted insiders, we can mitigate potential vulnerabilities. So mail voting really increases access and opportunity for the voter, disincentivizes an adversarial attack, and that's a double win for the US and democracy. Turning to you, Josh, you've been recognized for your work around the security of polling places during elections. Can you provide an overview of the vulnerabilities your research highlighted in Maryland? Yeah, so Natalie and I are pretty proud that some of our work has been used in real life at actual boards of elections. And uh, we're proud that our work, specifically the work that we did in developing uh, training modules for uh, election workers has been used by our boards of elections uh, partners, and they were recognized for the 2020 uh, Clearinghouse Award for Outstanding Innovation in Election Cybersecurity and Technology. And that was specifically for their use of our training modules leading up to the 2020 primary election. In general, our work, I think, has taken a holistic approach or a systems approach to looking at election security and vulnerability from the cyber, physical, and insider threat point of view. It's kind of interesting because Maryland uh, like 30 other states, uses standard equipment across the entire state, where 19 states can vary between different precincts or different counties. So this allows Maryland an opportunity to develop a statewide strategy to train poll workers. As Natalie said, trusted insiders are probably the best, uh, uh, best approach where we can have an immediate effect on improving election security. So I think that one of the biggest opportunities for Maryland for better securing our elections and preserving integrity is to better fund local boards of elections and enable them and enable poll workers to have the awareness to be able to identify and, and mitigate those threats. And you both discussed the three different types of threats in your work, insider, physical, and cyber threats. Which is the most prominent and how can state legislators ensure that mail-in voting is the best solution to fight these attacks on elections? Our analysis in our work has shown that for both mail-in voting and for in-voting processes, uh, trusted insiders are possibly the most prominent threat. And that should not really be surprising because if you think the, the nearly, again, one million poll workers that manage our elections, they're the ones who actually touch each part of the voting process. And that isn't to say that these trusted insiders are malicious anyway, but they can make mistakes that can cause a threat through an honest mistake. Uh, so I think we both strongly believe that strong training programs for election workers and examination of our mail-in voting process and in-voting process in an unbiased way can show that these processes are secure while maintaining wide access and availability to vote in the future. A lot of the current focus is on voting access, but do you all anticipate the need for security moving forward? If it's not the threat we've seen before, it might manifest in a different way. So we absolutely always have to think about election security as a forefront when also increasing access. 
And what's nice, I think, about some of the contributions of our research is that we're able to identify ways to keep those votes integrity and keep those votes secure while also increasing access at the same time. Thank you both so much for joining us.